Hi, Tara. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much for having me. I would love to hear in your words for anyone who is listening. Can you tell us a little bit more about your business and the work that you do? Yeah, so I um, have been in business for a really long time. Um, Right now, I call myself a business and marketing coach just because it's very general. It allows me to have like a bigger umbrella of offers and topics underneath that. Um, So I'm not niching down my entire business. A huge part of my audience is also fellow introverts, fellow multi-passionates. And I think that both of those types of people aren't necessarily talked to a lot when it comes to the ways to market your business. And like, I see a lot of messaging around focus on one thing. You have to niche down, have one signature offer. And that has never felt right to me. (laughs) So I'm, I'm big on building a business that maybe looks different, but works for you. I love that. And it's so perfectly aligned with this series about doing business differently. Can you tell us a little bit about what brought you to this? Because you've obviously got different offers, lots of different things going on. But what brought you to the point where you could kind of accept the fact that you worked differently to a lot of the messaging that was out there and got to the point where you've sort of got this entire suite of different offers that are going out at different times throughout mm-hmm. the year? Uh, it took me about 10 years <laughs> to actually get to the point where I realized I was pivoting way too much because I would just get bored. The multi-passionate in me would get bored with doing the same thing over and over again. So I had pivoted about three or four times with like within three to four months each and I realized, you know, this is not the way to build a business. This, this, I have no consistency. I'm not able to continuously grow because I'm just like totally burning it all down and starting over every three to four months, which yeah. is definitely not sustainable at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so I knew I had to figure out a way to make, to make this work for me. And what I had to do is realize that all this advice that I was taking in, was not necessarily the right voices that I should listen to. Mm. So I started to figure out like, how can I make this work for me? If I, if I don't, if I like break out of this box that I'm trying to force myself in, how can I still make it work in a way that doesn't feel like I'm being pulled in a million different directions? Like I'm not going to get bored, but it's going to allow me to really build my audience, but have them in kind of buckets. So that's where I kind of really focused and dived in on the value ladder um, analogy where you kind of build a ladder ecosystem of different offers that work together. And because I'm a multi-passionate, I have about 10 different <laughs> value ladders and some people are interested in in different topics. So there maybe are in three of my funnels and three of my ladders and other people are maybe just in one, but figuring out a way to do that in a way that makes sense with mainly my email, because that's my main marketing. So I really focused in on how can I segment my audience Mm. so that I'm not writing emails that are like speaking to everyone, because it is true. That's why I think niching is so popular. Yeah, it is true that if you talk to everyone, you're not talking to anyone. So doing the value ladder kind of strategy for my business really allows me to as a entire business speak to everyone, but Mm -hmm. I'm not speaking to everyone at once in my audience. Yeah, I love that. You said so many things there that I think that I absolutely resonate with and agree with. And I think so many people listening will agree with as well. The first one is, and this is something I think about so often because my audience are introverts mostly as well and highly sensitive people, that when we're in the online space in particular, because there is so much noise, there's so much messaging, everyone is kind of teaching the thing that's worked for them. And so as a result, you've got a million different options that you can go with and people showcasing their success in all those different ways. And for introverts, because we're naturally affected and impacted by the energy of others, I think that it can actually get really, if we're not really mindful and intentional about how we're showing up 
online and consuming information and content, we can actually get really heavily influenced by all of that messaging. How have you navigated that in making that decision to make your business more aligned for you than just going, oh, what everyone's saying, I have to niche down. I have to pick one signature offer in coming back to finding your truth and the way that you work best to make that work for you. Yeah, that's a really, I I feel like too, even the multi-passionate in me, because I love learning. It's like, I take in everyone else's master classes and courses and trainings. And then I just have way too much going on in my head yes. to actually focus and figure out what's right for me. So one thing that was probably one of the main reasons why I decided to leave Instagram last June is because mm. I really found that Instagram was the worst place for me. Um, yes. I, I liked creating content for Instagram. I didn't actually mind showing up and engaging in a way that worked for me. Like I wasn't doing reels or anything, but, um, the, the thing that really affected me was just scrolling my feed and just taking in all of this information. Mm -hmm. And I, I tried to curate my feed a little bit more and it's still, it was just too much. I was overloaded with information. So that was one of the reasons why I left Instagram. I think it's Also, one of the reasons why I now scrub my inbox every month and I try to like any email I open, I try to really look at it and determine like, is this something I'm going to want to hear more about in the next couple of months? If not, then I'm going to unsubscribe. It's, it's not like I'm saying anything bad about the person. Like it's just their content. I don't have space for their content or any offers that they're putting out. So I'm actually doing them a favor by unsubscribing. And I look as at unsubscribers from my own list in the same way they're they're not interested right now. That's fine. They're, they're more than welcome to leave, come back later. And like one other thing I did was Facebook groups at one time last year, I realized I'm in about 300 different Facebook groups. It gets because I, so out of control. <laughs> I know because I have all these different niches and topics. Like I was in um, Facebook groups just for bloggers. I was in ones for virtual assistants and then I was in one for each of the tools that I use and I was in ones for all kinds of different events and summits that I had signed up for. And it was a lot. And so I went through every single group and got it down. My goal was 50. I think I got it down to about 70, but that was close enough. So things like little things like that, that you can do if you realize that you're, you're just feeling overloaded, which that, that can really affect you and mm. kind of paralyze you when it comes to actually focusing on your own business and growth. Absolutely. There are so many gems in there. I just want to pick out a couple that I think just to really reinforce the people listening. The first one that you mentioned about the emails from both sides as both a consumer of content and a creator, actually being a little bit more compassionate on both sides to ourselves and to the people. I love how you framed that, that you're doing them a service by unsubscribing when it's not aligned for you because then it helps them to keep their list really clean with people Mm -hmm. who are going to be aligned for that. And also to remember that so often when people are coming in and out of our communities, our ecosystem, that it's so rarely about us and oftentimes about other things that are going on or they've signed up for something else elsewhere. And I know I definitely do that as well. Try to reduce how much I'm taking in at any time and really focus in on, okay, what's my focus at the moment? If I'm part of this or I'm joining this program or working with this coach, how can I kind of reduce some of that additional noise so I'm not getting Mm -hmm. bounced around? Such a great reminder, I think, on both sides for how we can reframe that to be actually a really positive thing. So thank you so much for sharing that. Another thing I can share with that. Yes, please do. That's that's a really good tip that I started doing um, because I'm multi-passionate, because I'm a learner. I've accumulated a lot of self-study courses and resources, especially from Summit All Access Passes and bundles. Um, so I finally got them all into a Notion space. I have them all tagged and categorized. Amazing. So I, I've been doing my what I call my CEO Fridays, where I'm just focusing on brainstorming, mind mapping, content creation for my own business. But then I also carve out a little bit of time to go in there and go through one course or one masterclass or one thing in there um, around a topic that I'm, that I want to learn more about because Mm. just signing up and never using them, that's not doing 
me any good. I mean, even if they were tech, they're never free, but even if they were kind of free because they were in a bundle, um, I still want to make use of them. I still want to go through them. So I have to do that to actually use all of these assets and resources that I have. And that way I know like, and stop myself from signing up for another course yes. on the same thing. I can go in there and be like, okay, filter by email marketing. Okay. I have lots of that I haven't gone through yet. So yeah. I shouldn't sign up for anything new. <laughs> Brilliant advice. <laughs> and I think as well, it's so easy. I always call it like your digital bookshelf. It's like you just accumulate all of this stuff and actually forget what you've got. So even just having it in front of you to be able to see, oh, I've bought six courses about email marketing. So that other one I've been looking at, let's not even go there. And so actually mm-hmm. being able to have, I, I just think anytime you can get things out of your head and somewhere where you can see the bigger picture of it is going to be helpful. But that is excellent advice. The other one I wanted to touch on that you mentioned as well was leaving Instagram because I know a lot of people that are clients that are in my spaces as well find Instagram to be quite draining and think about leaving. I mean, I thought about even leaving the platform a bunch myself, but it is the place that So often, especially for people who are just starting out, have kind of been taught like you have to be on Instagram. That's the place to be, to grow your business, Mm -hmm. to build a community, to share your work and get it out there. First of all, I would love to know, like, was that an easy decision for you? And how did you transition out of like being okay with that decision? Because I think that there's no right or wrong decisions by any means, but I know Mm -hmm. that it's a difficult one to make because there's just, there's like a FOMO energy around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, so I left in June of last year and I think it was in January when I started to think like, oh, I'm, I'm really feeling a drain with Instagram. Like I've, I've always had this love hate relationship with it. Some months I'm just, I'm all in and I'm like showing up and engaging every day. And then other months it's just like, oh, I don't even want to open the app. It's just (laughs) exhausting. So January, I realized I hadn't really been doing much on Instagram in December. And I was like, I'm really not missing it at all. Mm -hmm. So maybe I should start to think about if I should let that time that I'm spending go and focus on other methods that are maybe more fun. Like for me, that's email marketing, blogging, Pinterest. But the thing is in January, I had about six months worth of content already ready for Instagram. It was already scheduled. Like I I was six months ahead, like with content, unless something new came up. Um, because content is, is I always loved creating the content part of it, but responding to comments and all of that was Mm. just like, Oh, it's too much energy. Um, so, so I let myself, I was like, okay, I'll just, I'll stop engaging, showing up and I'll just let that content run out and then I'll see how it feels. Um, so in the meantime, I went into my Google analytics. And I was like, okay, let's really check out what Instagram has been doing for me because I'm spending, I was spending a lot of time creating the content, engaging and, and not just time, but energy, (laughs) my energy. I I don't have an ongoing supply of energy. So I have to be really mindful about where I'm using that energy and how much is being spent and looking at the numbers. I mean, my goal was to get people onto my website excuse me. And then onto my email list where that was my main, where I wanted them to end up. Um, and the, the number was so low (laughs) compared to Facebook where I was spending zero time and zero energy. I was like, this does not like even add. So it was kind of like a, a confirmation that I was leaning in the right direction when I was thinking about leaving. I'm like, okay, this, this, the, looking at the actual data and the numbers, that kind of gives me permission to let this go and see what happens. So I, as soon as my content ran out, I posted a, um, it was just a picture of me, one of my branding photos where I'm pointing up and I wrote the words goodbye. <laughs> and I just put in the caption, Hey, just, um, I'm leaving Instagram. Um, if you want to stay connected, make sure to get on my email list. That's where I will be emailing more often and sharing all of the good value content and everything. Um, and I have, I've, I've probably logged into the app like once a month since then, just to check messages. That is really cool because I think what your story 
shows there is actually coming back at the end of the day and reviewing on a regular basis how our efforts in content marketing are actually like how they're impacting the bottom line of what we're trying to do and what our goals are. And I think so often we just go with the flow of what the trends are, what everyone else is doing, what the experts Mm -hmm. are saying we should do without actually coming back to what is my energy? You know, where is, what's the capacity there for that? Where's the most energy output going? And is the return on that in terms of my goals actually Mm -hmm. making sense in the grand scheme of the things that I'm showing up and doing every day in my business. Such a great reminder why checking those analytics Mm -hmm. and looking at those different things are so valuable in our businesses, even for those of us who aren't data kind of people and are more (laughs) creative Mm -hmm. and intuitive and flowy, how that can actually be really helpful to see like right in front of you. This is taking up the most amount of energy and actually not really doing anything to help me grow my business. Thank you so much for sharing that Mm -hmm. story. Yeah. I think a big thing too, is along with the the FOMO feelings and like making that big step, like Mm. you can leave for a, like, I'm not saying I'll never go back to Instagram. Um, like if I ever feel like it again, I I might Mm. go back and just do stories, um, and see how that feels or how that starts working. But it it doesn't have to be forever. Any Mm. announcement or decision you make, like it's your business, you make the, your own rules. So, um, if, if you're feeling that, don't let the FOMO um, force you to stick around on a platform that isn't really doing anything but draining your energy and wasting your time that could be better spent on, on other things. Yeah, absolutely. And you're so right. Nothing is actually really permanent. And so it can always be just how does it feel this month? You know, what am I doing next month? Mm -hmm. Instead of, oh, well, that's it. I said I wasn't going to be on here, so I'm never going back. I just want to kind of switch lanes a little bit from the social media and and showing up online side of things to the more practicalities of how you run your business as a multi-passionate person. Because as we've already talked about, that can be against or counter to a lot of the messaging that's out there about having just like one core offer and one ladder one audience that you're speaking to how do you manage your energy when you have so many different things that are kind of going on throughout the year yeah so I think like I'll share so I actually right now have over 50 different digital products offers services so (laughs) there's there's a lot and probably topic wise there's I would probably say that they could fit into like 10 to 15 different like types of bucket topics. So it's, if I was to talk about all of those at once, it would be so messy and confusing and overwhelming. Um, So I try to go through like seasonal changes. Like what do I want to focus on this month? Maybe I'll pick one or two things or two to three things. If I'm launching something, Um, it's not like you have to throw everything at somebody (laughs) right off the bat. And I think with with the value ladder analogy, that's where you're really going to want to have really great evergreen email sequences set up so that mm-hmm. you don't have to remember to talk about some of those evergreen offers. Your email sequences are doing that for you in the background to the right people. Yeah, that's really great advice. For someone who might just be starting out or they're trying to work out how to manage that, do you have any tips for how they can even work out? Do you plan across a year? Do you have any advice for making that work for you as someone who has many, many things going on <laughs> at the same time? Yeah, so I I used to try to do yearly and I realized that it doesn't really work for me because um, I'm the kind of person I really like having flexibility because I get these um, fresh ideas that will pop into my head and I'm so Mm -hmm. excited about it that I'll want to just work nonstop to get it launched. Um, (laughs) So I know that things are going to shift and I, I need that kind of space. And so I do plan things, but doing a full year, like I have no idea what I'm going to be doing a year from now. So I usually now try to focus on quarterly. So I'll um, usually have quarter one mapped out right now. I'm kind of finalizing the end of quarter one and then focusing on quarter two, Um, always a quarter ahead. And anything I put on there is like just an idea. 
something because mm-hmm. it could move if I have mm-hmm. an idea. Um, so I, I do like to plan, but nothing is finalized. <laughs> I really love that because I think, again, it's another great reminder for everyone who's listening that it's our own business and the whole point of it is to create something that feels really aligned and good for you. And that is going to mean ebbing and flowing with the energy of where you're at in any given moment and the fact that things will change and you can sit down and plan out a whole year, but I'm the same as you. I stopped (laughs) doing that a few years ago because I'd get to the end of the year and be like, wow, this is nothing. (laughs) I I had wasted all that time at the start of the year trying to plan out because exactly that. We don't know what other ideas or other offers are going to come our way that are going to be more perfect for that timing yeah I mean (laughs) yeah it's a lot it's a lot of sitting down planning hoping that it works out that way and it almost never does yeah you know in in um q4 last year I had this kind of inkling of an idea like maybe I'll do another um virtual event or summit for um q4 and then I think it was the middle of November I or maybe the beginning of November I was talking to somebody who I was considering like partnering with on it and she was on board. So I was like, okay, let's do it. So did the entire event and launch and plan and did an entire week live event (laughs) the first week of December. Um, And I mean, even a month before that, I wouldn't have planned for that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That brings me to like a question I'd really like to ask you about how you decide when to switch gears and change some of that planning and shuffle some things around to fit in a new idea and how you decide to go, okay, it's this time of year or I've got this other stuff happening. I'm excited about this idea, but I'm going to shelve that for another time or later in the year. Do you have some sort of system for working out for yourself which direction you want to go with that? Um, a little bit. Like I, I know certain things like the summer months I know are pretty quiet. So if I'm going to launch anything, it's just going to be a smaller digital product. It's not going to be like a group program where people have to show up. Um, and usually that I take that as my time to kind of brainstorm and map out the rest of the year in the summer. Also January, I try to keep light because I know coming off the holidays that I usually am not ready to just jump right back into it. And then I also now with with our business model, the Introvertpreneur Summit that we run every April, um, we're doing the third annual one this year in 2023. So usually April, I don't plan anything else. And I know like that's that's a given. I know I'm doing the summit. I'll try not to schedule any other launches or do anything else that's going to um, impact my schedule. Cause I know that that event takes a lot of planning and energy. So I just want to be able to focus on that. Yeah. It's one of a couple of big events I think you do throughout the year. And it's one I'm really excited to be a part of this year. First of all, what do you love about this online? Of like big, I mean, they're not just little events, they're big events. This one, I think you, uh, you mentioned, yeah, it's one that you've been doing for a few years now, and it seems to just be getting bigger every year that you do it. How do you navigate that and your energy when you're holding space for not just having to market it as an event, but also coordinate all of the speakers, make sure that that's all working behind the Mm -hmm. scenes and then have that going out there. Yeah. So I I think one of the biggest things that I've learned that works really well for me um, is automations and Mm -hmm. systems. I'm big on anything that can help me streamline something. So I mean, you, you've probably gotten our automated emails from Airtable. We have all these automated emails set up for all the speakers. So mm-hmm. we put in the dates that um, the basic information form was filled out. And then those anyone who hasn't filled it out will get the reminder. Everyone who has will not get it. Um, same with when the presentation is due. We send that out. We have automations for when the summit goes live. So we have all of that in place now, whereas... I mean, our first one, we were doing everything manually, which was a Mm. disaster, but I think that's good to do it that way because then you kind of, you can fine tune things. Um, It definitely has gotten easier after that first event. Each one has gotten a little easier and more streamlined, but yeah, having some kind of automations in place, anything you can do to make it um, easier. Like even my podcast, I, I used to have it where, Um, somebody would fill out the podcast application form to be a guest on my podcast. I would, um, it would go into ClickUp. I would go through, review it. And anytime I wanted to 
um, have somebody book to be a guest, I would tag my VA to manually email them the booking link. And I realized, why am I having her do this? This I could set this up as an automation in ClickUp where once I change the status from, I don't know what the status is as soon as they submit, but as soon as I change it to send email, it will automatically send them the email with the booking link. So that eliminates that whole step, which is fantastic. Yeah, definitely. And I know for a lot of people, especially a lot of introverted people, the thought of doing events anyway is a little bit daunting, even Mm -hmm. just being a speaker or going to events, but to be not just the host and showing up in that way, in a a public way, but also organizing all of the behind the scenes and the marketing and all of the things, something that you do a, a number of times a year. What is it about this format that you have found works really well for you as an introvert in business that for someone who's listening to this going, oh my gosh, I could never put myself forward for that, be part of something like that, or ever think to run an event of that size. Do you have any tips or or even thoughts that might help someone change their mind about why this is a really great way to get your name and your work out into the world? Yeah, I I love a special so I I do have done multiple different events. I think the Introvertpreneur Virtual Summit is definitely my favorite because um I I can be my introverted self. So it's all evergreen, everything's pre-recorded. Um I don't do live events. <clears throat> we might do a couple panels. This one, I'm not sure yet, but um, it, it can be entirely like pre-recorded. It can, and that means that you can edit things as needed. It doesn't have to be live and force yourself to show up. So, I mean, even I've seen many people do those micro audio summits where it's just audio only, there's no video. Um, so there's so many ways to make it work for you. And even if you think that, you have to do live components. Um, like I've done ones where I've done a uh, hour or two hour live panel every day. That was a little exhausting. <laughs> um, and then with the December event that was happened very quickly, that was an entirely live four day um, event that was from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. every single day. Wow! And I knew going into that, I was like, there's no way I can do that myself. So I actually hired and paid a co-host for each day. I had a different co-host um, to kind of help me handle the tech of handling the live day-to-day on Zoom. I was really worried that people wouldn't show up, the scheduled speakers. I just had it in my head like, oh, what if somebody doesn't show up? Then I'm going to have to like ad lib for an hour. And that was terrifying to me as an introvert, but um, it worked really well. And I'm, I'm really glad that I went the route of having co-hosts because I would, I was still burnt out and exhausted at the end of the week, Mm. but there's no way I could have done it without co-hosts. It would have, I would have made it through maybe day one and day two. I would have just been like, event is canceled. I'm so sorry. So yeah, there's, there's definitely ways that you can make it work for you and your audience. Mm. You don't, you can, you can create it around your personality and how you want to show up. Um, best. Yeah. And I I think that you've said so many things during this conversation that just continue to reinforce not just the fact that that's absolutely doable, but how important it is to create a business that you actually love, even if it looks different from what everyone is saying it should look like or what your peers and people who are also in your industry are doing. So I think that's a really great reminder for everyone. You also mentioned very early on that it took you 10 years to get to this point where you're not just comfortable doing things on your own terms, but also having found that flow of how it all works together in the ecosystem of your business. For someone who has maybe not got that many years under their belt and they're trying to just navigate the complexities of all of that, do you have any tips or suggestions on where you would recommend that they get started to just find that, find the ecosystem or start to create the ecosystem for themselves that is more in alignment with their goals and the way that they work best versus what they may be have perceived or think that they should be doing to find success in their business? Yeah, I I think one of the biggest things I would say is to, I, I think trial and error is a big part of it. So I do think there's going to be a learning period there where um, you want to try different things and different strategies to see how it feels, to see if it's going to work for you. But if, if you know pretty quickly that it's not going to work, 
give yourself permission to make that shift and allow yourself the room to try something different uh, because you will find what's going to work for you. I mean, it took me 10 years because I didn't realize that sooner. I didn't have anyone telling me that. I had instead people telling me that I had to do reels in order to be successful and that you have to do video. And I was forcing myself to do those things. And Mm -hmm. It was not only draining, it wasn't working. It was very uncomfortable for me and my audience. It was, I, and I think that's a big piece when it comes to being, in, especially if you're an introvert, I think if you're doing something that is really uncomfortable and, and draining for you, especially if it's video, people can see that and they're not going to, it. like, it's not going to get you the results that you want anyway. So maybe the person you're listening to is more of an extrovert. So yeah, they're going to recommend video because it works for them. They have a really outgoing and energetic personality. They thrive on video. So (laughs) that makes sense. So I, I think the big lesson is to any information you're taking in from somebody, whether it's a social media post telling you about how they got a 40k launch or something, really listen to what they're saying and take a look at their business and see who they are as a person. And how if if what they're saying ties into their strengths, then you can be like, yeah, that makes sense. But that's not going to work for me, because I don't like showing up that way. Or I, I think that's a big thing too, when it comes to people who, you know, are especially if they're newer, if you're doing this at the start, and you're doing it as a side hustle, and with the goal to go full time, you can't really compare yourself to somebody else who has a huge team, is doing this full time, has been in business for 10 years. Um, You can't really compare the amount of time that you have doing it as a side hustle with what they're able to accomplish with their situation and their circumstances. Yeah, such an important thing. And I definitely agree with you there. It's so easy, I think, to get drawn into this idea of that overnight success story Mm -hmm. that we see so often in the online space. And the reality being that we're not getting the full picture all the time anyway, but that it also doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to fit into that box that that person Mm -hmm. has created of of what's made them successful. And practicing that discernment when we're online of actually looking below the surface of what is it that they're going to be teaching based on what I can see that they're doing? And is that going to work for me and sometimes you don't know until you're already in but I always find that I learn something even if I've mm-hmm. still gotten drawn into that yeah. there's always something for me to take and implement or change or go you know what I've learned a really big lesson there about not getting drawn into the story and actually looking at the the bigger picture behind the scenes it's funny about the overnight success because I know um, my first business it was a handmade jewelry business and um it, it kind of blew up when Amazon handmade came out and I, I remember at that time that somebody was like, oh, your overnight success. You're so lucky. And I was like, um, this, I I've been doing this for nine years. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not, it was not overnight success at mm. all, <laughs> but I mean, you know, I don't think that it's sustainable to be operating or thinking in that way either. I am a big fan. I talk to my community about this all the time of like the tortoise and the hare as well. And actually just embracing that tortoise energy that is just so in alignment for introverts of mm-hmm. not worrying about what else is going on, what big action and, and activity is happening, but actually just focusing on taking one small step at a time because that's what is going to get you to where you Mm -hmm. want to go if you can start to tune some of that out a little bit which I just think you leaving Instagram is such a perfect analogy or example of of sometimes you have to be drastic like that Mm -hmm. to be able to just focus on your own race as well yeah definitely so for anyone who is listening to this and wants to come along to the introvertpreneur summit which is happening very very soon can you give us a little bit of an idea of what they can expect when they sign up for that yeah so this year's summit is going to be incredible i had initially planned on putting it for up to three days instead of the normal five days. But we just had so many amazing people wanting to be speakers and I could not narrow it down. So it's still going to be five days. So once you sign up every day, you'll get an email. The presentations for that day will be released and you can watch them throughout the day at 
your convenience. And then the next day, the new presentations will drop. And I mean, I think we have 40, 40, 42 speakers. And there's a, a couple pretty unique speakers and presentations that I'm excited about. Like there's one around a topic that we've never had about making sure that you're eating healthy. And I was like, oh, this is so for me right now because <laughs> I've been like ordering DoorDash. Um <laughs> probably almost every day um, for the last few months. So I'm like, yeah, this is, I I love having some unique voices. And I think Mm. like the event, the speakers, the lineup is really diverse. Um, I'm so excited for for how it's looking. You're going to get so much information around mindset, productivity, marketing for introverts, and everything is geared towards introverts. So one thing I'll share too, I've never actually had a presentation around video marketing, because I'm always somebody who says like, you don't have to be on video, but I know it's like some introverts do love being on video. So I wanted to include a presentation on that. So there is a presentation on video marketing. So if you're somebody who wants to do video, but maybe you just have fear holding you back, that's going to help you out with that. But yeah, it's always an amazing event. There's lots of engagement and I just love bringing introverts together. I feel like every introvert I meet, I'm like, oh yeah, you're my person. Like you totally can relate to everything I'm feeling. And it's not like um, I'm being thrown into a Facebook group where there's a bazillion different personalities and voices being thrown at you. This is Mm. um, really more of a calm, reserved event. That's why I'm like, there's, there's probably not going to be any live. It's watch at your own pace, watch what you want, um, take what you need, watch the presentations that are going to help you move forward the most over the next couple of months. Um, and then of course you can get the all access pass, which has all kinds of extras if you want lifetime access to all the recordings too. That's so amazing. And it's such a great deal as well it's just so much great stuff in there and thank you for saying that as well because I was going to ask you one thing that I find with these kind of events whether they're in person or online that it can get overwhelming with just how much there is to consume and sometimes that can lead to Mm -hmm. oh I just I don't know it's too much I can't even bother and I love and I want to really emphasize what you said there about go through look at who's speaking and the ones that are really going to connect with where you want to go this year so that you can Mm -hmm. get that information and if you are starting to feel overwhelmed just let go of the the facts that there's some that aren't maybe aligned for you right now and then having that all access pass there yeah I think I think I have a list of about eight presentations that I want to watch so I mean that is totally doable throughout the week so yeah they're all going to be amazing but I'm like what do I really want like what is my top (laughs) and I made my own list so yeah, don't feel like you have to consume everything. Like there's mm. there's no way almost. And I can just feel the learner in you, like the person who just loves to take in information uh, because of how excited I can tell you are about what's coming in that week. It's like creating this amazing uh, experience that you're going to get so much out of. And then it's like, oh, if you want to come along to this too, you can. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm glad I have my own lifetime access because I'm yeah. sure I'll go back and watch all of them at some point and take notes on all of them at some point, but (laughs) add them to your little spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) I love that so much. All of the details, the links for everything that you're doing and the Introvertpreneur Summit are all going to be in the show notes. But for anyone who would like to connect with you further, what is the best way for them to do that? Yeah. So probably the best way would be to go to my free resources page, um, sign up for any one of my freebies, Um, I do have a really good one for multi-passionates about mapping out your own value ladder. Um, Mm -hmm. I still use that workbook myself to map out new offers. So that's really helpful. But if you sign up for any freebie, um, you'll get on my email list. And that's where I'm really active and really sending the good the good stuff. (laughs) That sounds fantastic. And I'm on Tara's list and everything is always super high value. So definitely jump on that. Thank you again so much, Tara. I cannot wait to be a part of the Introvertpreneur Summit with you. And yeah, thank you for being here today.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed hearing from Tara about being a multi-passionate introverted entrepreneur and how she runs her business. I hope that you'll join us for the Introvertpreneur Summit where I'm so excited to be one of the 40 amazing speakers during that week. All of the links to find out more about that as well as more about Tara and her work are in the description down below. Let me know in the comments below if we're going to see you there. Otherwise, I'll catch you in the next one.